program in celebration of Yellowstone National Park through the lens of time. Photography by Bradley Boner and William Henry Jackson. I'm Grace Davis. I'm the assistant curator of youth and adult education here. This exhibit compares photographs by William Henry Jackson's Yellowstone photography of 1871 with local photographer Bradley Boner's contemporary shots from the same vantage point, celebrating the work of each artist's um, photography and the validation of the of a century of conservation efforts um, of these beautiful landscapes. Um, the exhibit will officially open today and remain on view through August 28th. Um, we typically have these sneak peek programs to offer the public an opportunity to have a more intimate experience with a guest speaker. Um, our guest speakers will be Adam Harris, our curator of art, and Bradley Boner, uh, the contemporary photographer. Um, we will additionally have, in about a month, at the very end of the hallway, two uh, cases of Yellowstone memorabilia um, from the Stephen Shirley collection, so be sure to come back and see that. So to start our program, I'd like to introduce Adam Harris, our Peterson Curator of Art, um, as he will give you an overview of the exhibit um, and let you know how it's being set up. Right. <laughs> so thanks everybody for coming. I won't say too much because I know that uh, Brad has a lot of really interesting stories and you probably have a lot of questions for him. Um, I wanted to just frame this in the context of this whole summer. Uh, this summer is the 100th anniversary of the National Park Service. And so we uh, put together three different exhibits honoring three different parks. Uh, the first one is Grand Teton National Park in Art, which is in the two galleries right over on the other side of this wall. There's this great exhibit about Yellowstone. And then in a couple weeks, we'll be opening a wonderful show of Ansel Adams photography that is a portfolio he did while on a trip through, Yo through Yosemite with Georgia O'Keeffe and a few rock colors um, that we were lucky, this portfolio we were lucky enough to be gifted about 10 years ago, uh, no, about 12 years ago, and it's been on exhibit here once, and then it's been out on tour, and so we thought that that would be a great thing to have in addition. So by the time the summer really gets rolling, we'll have these three amazing exhibits up celebrating our national parks. Um, another really important and special thing to note is that you've got, uh, Photos here by William Henry Jackson, reproductions of photos that were taken in 1871. On the same trip, uh, Thomas Moran, the painter, accompanied him uh, into Yellowstone. And those two, Jackson and Moran, when they went back to Washington, D.C., it was their images that really helped convince Congress to create the world's first national park, um, which was Yellowstone in 1872. So there's this amazing connection that we have. We have four Moran paintings from a later trip that he took uh, of the Tetons in the next exhibit over. Um, and so I encourage you to go see those and you can then kind of think about this wonderful connection between Moran and Jackson. And then we've got it coming straight up into contemporary times with Brad's amazing photos that took him three summers at least to do to put this whole thing together where he went and retraced Jackson, Jackson's steps through Yellowstone and took photos from as close as he could come to the original vantage point. And so much fun. This morning, all week, we've been having such a great time walking through, looking closely. These are photos that you really want to get up close and look at and compare. And you can just see how, in many cases, there may be a new road or a new bridge, or you might see a bridge has disappeared in at least one case. But it just goes to show you, because of the similarity, between these sets of images, how wonderful the conservation of the park has been and what a great job they've done. So, without any further ado, are you going to introduce Brad? I can. Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> so, I'd like to introduce Bradley Dishboner, who... Right. Yeah, like, everybody said. So, he's a photojournalist. His career has spanned two decades. He is the chief photographer at Jackson Hole News and Guide and the photo editor of Jackson Hole Magazine. Um, his work has been shown in multiple magazines and other... Uh, News outlets. News outlets. <laughs> um, and so without uh, any further ado, I will allow him to walk you down the hallway and discuss these things. If you'd like, there are stools over here. Um, if you want to sit down at any point in time, I encourage you to come grab one of those. Um, and now I will hand it over.
Uh, thank you very much, everybody, for coming, first of all. And I also need to thank the museum. Um, it, I've, I've worked at the Museum Guide for 12 years. I've been uh, working in Jackson for 12 years. And I never thought for a second I would have a, um, one picture hanging here, let alone in the entire gallery. And so it's, I mean, it's, for, for me personally, it's, it's just an honor to have my work hanging next to people. I've, I've admired like Thomas Moran and George O'Keefe and, and Ansel Adams. So just that in, in and of itself is very cool. And I really thank the museum for this opportunity. Um, and this project was really a labor of love for me. Um, and a lot of people helped me out along the way. One of them happens to be here, Joe Denzelmo. Um, she provided a lot of guidance and um, introduced me to a lot of very important people that helped make this possible. And I want to reiterate that it wouldn't have been possible without you. So thank you very much. Um, so anyways, um, just a little bit of background on how I kind of started this. I grew up in the Black Hills of South Dakota. And there was another photographer out there who kind of did the same thing and retraced the steps of the Custer expedition that went through the Black Hills in 1874. And I am kind of a history buff um, when it comes to the exploration of the American West. And so I started thinking and um, that uh, I, I wondered if anybody had done this with Jackson's work in Yellowstone I, as a, you know, growing up. Um, I'd always been familiar with his work and, and after a little bit of research I learned that no one had really done it as extensively as as, uh, as I had, um, as I had wanted to, and so I just kind of started um, uh, heading up to the park um, on my weekends. Uh, that first summer that I did it, um, I it quickly became apparent that I was going to need a lot more time mm -hmm. to do it uh, the way I wanted to do it, and um, um, just to just to cover everything. Um, and so the following summer, I took uh, uh, seven weeks off of my job at the Museum Guide and just devoted it to this project. Um, spent a lot of nights in my 78 Volkswagen van, um, <laughs> a lot of nights um, uh, uh, driving around, uh, a lot of early mornings and um, a lot of late evenings trying to get the best life. Um, but, um, you know, kind of jumping right into it, um, starting here, and moving that way basically um, uh, is a general, it, uh, uh, generally outlines the survey's route as uh, the survey went into Yellowstone. They started at Fort Ellis, which is just outside, which was just outside of Livingston, Montana, and they went down through Paradise Valley and into, into the park, the present day park. They visited Mammoth, went over to Tower Fall, up over Dunraven Pass. Uh, down into the Grand Canyon, the Yellowstone, and then they followed the Yellowstone River up to Yellowstone Lake. Uh, from there, a couple, uh, there was a, a smaller group that did a side trip over to the Upper Geyser Basin. Uh, they went to the Midway of the Upper Geyser Basin as well. Uh, they came back to the lake and then they did a circumnavigation of the Yellowstone Lake. And from there, they went up, I believe it's called Pelican Creek. Uh, up over the Mirror Plateau, which is basically the plateau that divides the drainages between the Yellowstone River and the uh, Lamar River. And then they dropped down into the Lamar Valley and followed that back to the Yellowstone River and then followed it out to the park. So they were in the park for about, I, it was about six or seven weeks uh, during the summer of 1871. And so, starting with these five in this group in here, these are all in Paradise Valley. Uh, outside of the park, and the reason we decided to include these first five is to just kind of give you an idea of what Yellowstone might look like um, uh, had it not become a national park. Uh, you can see uh, ranch houses over here, some irrigation over here, um, uh, some more ranches over here, and so it just gives you a little bit of a glimpse of um, you know what the Yellowstone landscape might have looked like. You know, dotted with homes, dotted with ranches, dotted with buildings. Uh, undoubtedly, you know, other attractions. Um, Dairy Queens. Dairy Queens. <laughs> uh, you know, it's it's not hard to um, yeah. it's not hard to imagine a Four Seasons of the Grand Canyon of the Yellowstone. <laughs> um, you know, those kind of things. So um, uh, that's kind of 
why we included you know these five uh, in the exhibit, and then you know we kind of start to move down this way, and then at, at the end we'll have some time for questions. But if anyone has quick questions about any one of these, uh, feel free to kind of shout it out, and I'll, uh, I'll uh, do my best to answer to, to answer it uh, quickly so we can kind of get through everything. Um, the second place they visited was was. Um, uh, Mammoth, Hot, yeah, Mammoth Hot Springs, and I would say that the reason we included this one was because it, it really shows the growth and expansion of the terraces. Most of the, the photographs that I, that I wanted to take, I wanted, I wanted to uh, mirror exactly what Jackson took, and in 90% of these, that's what you'll see. But the reason I did this one a little bit wider is because you can see that the terraces have, have expanded by several yards, and it's kind of a testament to how uh, uh, to how quickly these things can grow. And it's one of the few things that we can actually see, you know, growth over time. You know, a lot of these things we measure, a lot of the changes that we see, erosion and stuff like that, we see and we measure it in centuries and eons. And so this is a, like a really cool, you know, a really cool um, uh, way to see. Know, tangible change over time. There's a there's a, a few more uh, photographs of mammoth that show the same amount of expansion that aren't included in this exhibit. So uh, let's see. Over here, they crossed. This was the first bridge over the Yellowstone River, um, just about just upstream from the Lamar River. Um, pretty pretty neat story about about uh, about that that you can that you can read about. And then they moved up to Tower where they made a camp at Tower Fall. Uh, these three pictures here, I would say this one is one of my favorite, um, but you can see it in all three of these, is that this formation here called Sulphur Rock, which is here, here, and here, this little spire, um, has, has broken away. And fairly recently, uh, I might add, I've, I did a whole bunch of research looking, looking at photographs, and all the way up until the 1980s, uh, or the night, excuse me, the 1990s, uh, the base of uh, looking up at Tower Fall looked like this, and um, I, 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 I tried to find. I thought that there would be like a ranger or a Yellowstone fanatic who would know exactly <laughs> when these things fell down. Obviously, a pretty significant event because it blocked the course of the creek and uh, changed the course of the creek below. But no one can, you know, if anyone out there knows, can, can help me out. Again. <laughs> you know, let me know. Uh, get in touch with me. But, but uh, these two kind of show. These are above, uh, taken from above, looking down. Uh, th this one here is taken kind of from above, looking down. And if you scramble down into this little ditch here, uh, you get to this point, which is basically right at the brink of of uh, Tower Fall, and this is probably the most pronounced, uh, where you can see the change in sulfur rock, and the one below it, how they've, how they've kind of crumbled down. So, let's see, moving on, they went up and over Mount Washburn, dropped into, uh, they dropped into the Grand Canyon, these are, in, so these are just a little bit out of order, this is in the um, uh, um, mud volcano. Crater Hills. Crater Hills is uh, just west of Hayden Valley, and the, the boiling sulfur spring is uh, actually used to be one of the uh, bigger attractions in the early part of the park. It's still an old wagon trail. You can see like this old two-track wagon trail that goes out there, but the road now through Hayden Valley is about a mile to the east, and so you got to hike into this. It's really bizarre. You're just kind of standing there with this giant, it's just this boiling cauldron of water, just kind of spewing water, and there's nobody around. So it's, just, it's pretty neat, you know, if you want to take a neat little hike out of uh, Hayden Valley, go find uh, go find the Sulphur Spring, just because it's it's a really just it's a bizarre, you know, like out of this world experience. Um, being around this thing when there's when there's nobody around, be careful. Don't, don't get too close to it either. <laughs> um, the uh, in the mud geyser area, the mud geyser was also one of the the bigger attractions in the park. Uh, just like a lot of things in Yellowstone, the, the thermal activity.
activity, well, um, uh, uh, such as the, the stuff up at uh, Mammoth. Sometimes the stuff at Mammoth will um, change course overnight. Uh, some of those flows will just completely change course overnight. You'll wake up in the morning and the water's flowing in a completely different place. Um, apparently that's what happened in the mud geyser. Um, it it uh, uh, periodically went off a few times a day and it was, uh, like I said, it was one of the top attractions in the park for a number of years and then in the early 1900s, I believe, like, it just stopped working. And uh, they, they still don't uh, really even know why. Uh, there was a couple, there's a lot of earthquake activity in that area and um, uh, there was an earthquake, uh, I believe, but I think it was in the, it was in the, yeah, it was in the early 90s. Uh, there was an earthquake, and then all of a sudden the soil temperatures just skyrocketed and killed all the trees up, up on the hill. Um, and so it's just kind of a testament that you know these things are always you know shifting and uh, becoming more active, becoming less active. Who knows? Uh, there's there's a lot of steam coming out of it, but you know who knows? It could go off again someday. So uh, let's see. Oh. <clears throat> Moving down to the Grand Canyon area, the, the upper and lower falls of, in the Grand Canyon, these um, uh, were obviously, I think, one of the highlights of their uh, of their trip. And if you look at a couple of these, you, if you look really close, you can see where small chunks have broken off. Um, and I wouldn't even say small, you know, larger chunks of some of these of rocky outcrop properties have broken off. There's one photograph in, that is going to be in my book that is not in this exhibit where I got, I was, I was trying to find the, the photo point for it and I kind of lined up the background and uh, found, found the general location but I had gotten to the brink of the, I got to the brink of the canyon to where it drops off, you know, 800 feet into the canyon, and I didn't want to get any closer. It was probably three feet to my left. Well, the, the picture that Jackson had taken was probably 15 feet further to my left, and so the place where Jackson stood to take that photograph doesn't even exist anymore. And I think that's kind of a testament to some of the risks that Jackson took to to get some of these photographs. Um, uh, a lot of the ones in the Grand Canyon are popular overlooks. This is, this one is uh, just below the one that's uh, right off the parking lot. This one you can see. Uh, is that Grandview? Is it? Uh, it's the northern. The it's close. Uh, it's not Inspiration Point. It's um, well, I got it right here. <laughs> but, but real close. Lookout Point. Lookout Point is up here, and then. This one is taken from what is today called Red Rock Point. And you got to go down those stairs. There's a, there's a uh, uh, series of stairs, not on the north rim. Series of stairs you got to go down and uh, get down to that one. This one is this one is actually right at uh, Inspiration Point, but it's looking south. Sorry, we'll be going. And then over here, these are kind of above. This one's actually in between the lower falls and the upper falls, the um, uh, Crystal Falls on Cascade Creek. Um, a little waterfall kind of tucked away. There, you can you can hike around the, the trail. The North Rim Trail actually hikes around hikes around the top of that. A couple of overlooks. You can see where the overlooks are here. Um, Anyways, spell Jackson. Did he have any relations? Uh, uh, no, Jackson didn't have any relations. Uh, the, um, the guy that Jackson holds named after is Davy Jackson, and he was a trapper. Okay. First trapper in this area. So the the Yellowstone Lake was considered the Hayden Survey's kind of primary objective. And um, so when they got to when they got to the lake, they were pretty excited, and they 
this this uh, photograph right here of Fishing Bridge is actually right near where their first camp on on the lake was, and their first camp was right over here on the other side of these trees, and it was kind of right out in front of where the lake lodge is now. Not the lake hotel, but the log lodge. It's just to the north of the hotel, and uh, that's so that's where their first camp was. Uh, Half of the party moved over to the geyser basins, which we'll get to in a second, but the other half moved their camp down to West Thumb. And so they, uh, Jackson took a couple of pictures down there. There's one more of, uh, oh, it's right over here. It's, there's one more uh, that, that he took of um, the first boat on Yellowstone Lake, and that was taken at, at West Thumb as well. And then when the, when the group from the upper geyser basin came back, they rendezvoused and then they did a circumnavigation, a counterclockwise circumnavigation of the lake. From, from, the, from West Thumb, they went around to the south and uh, they made a camp on the south, it was it the southeast arm, and uh, Jackson went up to the, the hills above the southeast arm and took uh, a few photographs up there. This is one um, part of a panorama that Jackson actually took. He took a series of five photographs. And um, uh, th so this is just, just one of them uh, that's, that he took about a thousand feet up off the lake. And then they moved around, um, they, moved, they kept moving up the eastern shore, uh, Signal Point, kind of looking south. Uh, well, looking directly south on the um, uh, southeast arm. Even the rocks. Yeah, these rocks are still here. Cool thing about this one is when you really start drilling into it, you can see these rocks have broken down a little bit. These trees aren't there anymore, but their root system is you know, just hanging on, hanging on the shoreline there. One of the neat things that I that I tried to capture in some of these, and, and part of it was co coincidence, was um, some of the fires that happened in Yellowstone. It was, it, like for me, it was kind of a battle because uh, about three weeks into it, into that uh, 2012 season, there were a few fires up in Yellowstone that, that uh, made things a little tricky for me. But um, towards the end of the day, the keys would, the haze would blow out, and I got uh, one of these, I've got the name of the fire in here, but uh, one of these uh, burning over here in the distance, and this one is actually uh, burning well south in the, uh, in the wilderness, south of Yellowstone Institute. But this is about a 25,000 foot plume of smoke from uh, one of the big fires from that, from that year. 25,000 feet? 20, yeah, 25,000 foot plume of smoke. They, they, uh, in the afternoon, the what, fires um, uh, from the heat, they do what they call blow up. The fires get really active. And they'll just put a plume of smoke. Uh, Four up miles. In, Four up, plus miles. Yep. It can go 60,000 feet. Oh yeah, they can, they can go. And, and uh, I mean, they can get so bad that, that uh, airplanes have to divert around. Um, you can see them from space. <laughs> so, um, just the, the magnitude of, of the area, the magnitude of the, you know the, the fires in this area, and you know burning in a wilderness. Um, uh, a lot of these they just they, they do what they call manage them. A lot of the fires in, Yellow, in Yellowstone they they basically just manage the fires. They they kind of let nature take its course. My understanding is that if it's human caused, they'll put it out. Uh, if it is not, if it's um, uh, if nature causes a fire, they will let it burn um, as long as it's not threatening any structures or people or anything like that. Um, so for the most part, they really try to let the, you know, they really try to let the ecosystem do what the ecosystem is supposed to do. Um, and in Jackson's time, there were, um, uh, the, in, in a lot of their journals, they, they write that there were some fires in the area. Um, in fact, there's a couple over there where um, one one photograph on top it's the second to the last one over here of Soda Butte. Um, the photograph if you look at the if you look at the um, uh, the horizon 
on, on the top and the bottom one, you can see that the mountains are actually a little, look a little bit different. And that's because, it's, uh, I, I think it's because there were some fires in the area and um, it had obscured the horizon in Jackson's photograph. And so he actually drew it in. Um, so there's, so if you look real close at the top of the bottom, there's actually an extra mountain in, uh, in, uh, in Jackson's photo. Like, I don't think the entire shot. Yeah, it's like kind of Photoshop at the time. Um, uh, so yeah, it's, it's, it's just kind of a funny, you know. And, and I, I posted that in a couple places, and people noticed. They're like, what, you know, where did the mountain go? <laughs> so kind of another example of the Photoshop of the time that, um, would be when they went to the geyser basins, um, uh, I, I, I decided to include three different um, uh, craters that Jackson photographed, Castle, Grotto, and the Giant. And uh, they, uh, Jackson didn't have a lot of time at the upper geyser basin. He had only about a day. He got there in the morning, and uh, or I think he got there like late the night before. Got up in the morning, took a bunch of photographs, and then I think they left in the afternoon. So he didn't have a lot of time to photograph, and he kind of wrote that he was a little, a little bummed about that. He didn't get, uh, didn't get a chance to photograph very much. But uh, he did get one interruption, and that was the grotto. But one of the the things about in Jackson's time, the process that he used, the wet clay process, it would take anywhere between you know, several seconds to a couple of minutes to expose a, a frame. So, you know, it's not, he couldn't, he couldn't, uh, uh, he couldn't stop action like cameras of today can, but like cameras of today can. And so, if you look real closely, he actually etched on the negative uh, to kind of simulate, uh, uh, simulate spotting water. Because um, otherwise, you know, he wanted, he really wanted to show that he captured this guy for <laughs> yeah, but you know, he, he, it just looked like a big giant pot of smoke, and, and that's what this is actually what Grotto looks like most of the time. It's just a bunch of steam coming out, and so Jackson would actually um, scratch on on the negatives. There's a, the, the the other one of um, of the the boiling sulfur spray. You look at that one really close. It's got some scratch marks on it to kind of simulate that. Can you tell that from the photographs, or do you have to look? Oh, you can, uh, if you look real close, you can see these scratch marks on it, and those are not real. <laughs> so did you use the same equipment the whole way through the three years you were doing this? Or? I'm sorry? Were you using the same equipment the Absolutely not. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, I mean, no, you you were, oh, me, oh, well, my equipment. Yeah, I, I, for the bulk of it, and actually it's down here, we kind of just came up with this idea. They got this, uh, they got one of Jackson's cameras that he used. He didn't use it on this survey, but he supposedly used it in 1878 when he came to the Yellowstone for the third time with the Hayden survey. And so we decided to include my camera, which has um, since, the, the shutter has since more or less stopped working because it has about 300,000 shutter cycles on it. Um, which, you know, my camera with 300,000 shutter cycles on it, and then you take Jackson, where um, you know I could put my I could put my camera in my backpack. Jackson had an entire pack mule to pack his camera, pack his wet plates, all of his chemicals, and his portable dark tent. And in, uh, in his autobiography, in one of his autobiographies, he outlines that if he wanted to take a picture, he could get off his horse, kind of scout the scene, unpack all of his gear, set up his camera, set up his dark room, wet a plate, take a photo, develop the plate. And then pack everything back up in about a half an hour. So it took him a half an hour to take one photo. So when you look at some of these, a lot of these pictures, I noticed he, he would uh, he would scout scenes where he could make multiple photographs in one place, just because the, the survey was move, was constantly moving, and he kind of had it down to the level of efficiency where he would take a he would take a picture here, then he would turn his camera 180 degrees and take the picture down this way. Obviously, he probably had assistants that might have been developing uh, developing his stuff for him or moving his camera for him. In fact, sometimes uh, he had he, he had two cameras. He had a smaller camera called a stereo camera, and he would probably tell his assistant to take a picture of this with a stereo camera as well that were credited back to Jackson. So, 
Uh, let's see here. Did they ever do any animals or people? So, yeah, that's actually a, that's actually a good question. Uh, people will get to. Animals, um, um, like I say with the, uh, just with the exact uh, problem that you had with the geysers is that animals don't really stand still for you. Oh, yeah. And so, uh, and they were also a lot wilder um, uh, back then, and, and uh, uh, they were less tolerant of people because they just never saw people that much. And, and in their writing, they would say, we saw a bison or we saw an elk briefly, and the, the hunters would take off after them. Um, there is there is one picture that Jackson took. Uh, it's one of only two pictures that I couldn't find the original photo point for. Um, and one of those is a picture of an elk that one of the elk that one of the hunters shot. And it, it's it's a little comical because um, you know the elk is dead and they just kind of prop the head up and put like, a stick behind it. And I don't have it in this exhibit, but you can find it online. And so the you know, the elk it's like a, it's a Really nice elk with the antlers and the velvet and everything, and so you yeah, had just kind of propped its head up so it looks kind of like it's hanging out there. So <laughs> um, this was uh, this was the other photo I was telling you about um, that was taken at West Thumb, and uh, this is the first boat that was ever put on, on Yellowstone Lake, and um, uh, they they used this boat. They went all around the lake and did a whole bunch of soundings. Uh, there's a really cool map that uh, is, in the, is in Hayden's report from, from this uh, survey that has all these different soundings that they took, the depths of the different parts of the lake. And uh, my buddy and I in, in 2012 did a 10 day trip around Yellowstone Lake in our canoe to find a lot of these pictures uh, on Yellowstone Lake. And so that's kind of where we got the idea for that one. We, we thought, why not? Uh, so. This one, uh, this particular photograph was taken in 1872, and um, um, when uh, the Hayden survey returned to the Tetons, and it was the first time the Grand Teton had ever been photographed, and um, I decided to use it with my bio. It's uh, it's right up behind. It's on a peak, back behind Grand Targhee, yeah. and so if you look really closely, I'm holding this picture. Oh, that, cool. so I thought it would be a good photo. I think Angus actually gave me the idea to use that in my bio. So. Um, What's the equivalent of how wide an angle lens? What do you think you use to compare to a digital? Like a, I think a that I think that from what I understand, it was he 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 used at least two lenses, oh. and I think they were equivalent of about I'd say like a twenty-two to a twenty-five, oh, okay. and the other one was probably the equivalent of. Yes. <clears throat> when I uh, re-photographed this uh, uh, some years before you went up there, I found a rock and measured it. It was in my picture and your picture and William Henry Jackson's yeah. picture. It was several feet long and it had moved 18 inches. Really? <laughs> this is some of the uh, stuff you can do comparing these pictures. Water levels in the lake. Yep. Yep. Some people had asked me, if, you know, in, in 1872, he took a lot of pictures from from the uh, from the um, from back up in there, like the top of um, uh, oh, uh, on the other side of Table Mountain, really close to the Grand Teton. And um, I went up there right around the same time, and there was a lot more snow in Jackson's photographs. And everyone asked me, if, you know, can you is that a sign of climate change? And the answer is, well. Maybe um, because a scientist will tell you that they would want to see 40 photographs from 40 different years at the same, you know, and um, but there is definitely a lot more snow in Jackson photographs than, um, than there were in mine during the same time period. So we'll just leave it, we'll leave it at that. Um, and uh, the last set of pictures are right here around the corner. Jackson called camp studies. 
And these were the only ones that, that he would include people. There's a few more, there's actually a few more uh, camp scenes. But uh, he, took a, he, he took a lot of these to um, kind of show what it was like um, uh, for you know, folks back east, what it was like to you know, travel through this wilderness, um, camping in this wilderness. Uh, this is one of Jackson's more famous photographs from the survey. It shows him lined up on the on the uh, shore of Mirror Lake, which is up on the divide. You know, uh, earlier I said that that was up on the divide between the on the uh, drainage between the Yellowstone and the Lamar River. If you look real close, the water level is a lot higher today. <coughs> for what for what reason? I'm I'm not sure. But the place where they actually camped and took this photo is now is now underwater. This uh, is one of four pictures. This is the, the you know, second of four pictures that, that uh, Jackson took at Mirror Lake. And this was one of the hardest places to get to. It was, uh, you have to go about seven miles up the Lamar River on a trail. We had to ford the Lamar. And then from then on, we were off trail until we got to Mirror Lake. There's no trail that goes to Mirror Lake. And so for about four and a half miles, we were crawling over dead and down lodgepole pine trees. Um, it, was, it, it took us probably about five hours to go four miles uh, from the Lamar River uh, up to there just to take, uh, just to take four pictures. Um, right at the south end of the lake, you do a 180. This is what uh, that scene looks like. And the only way I found this photo was by, was by correlating uh, some of the uh, diary entries and journal entries of some of the other survey members, and and yeah, this is one of their. Um, this is a photo of the first camp on Yellowstone Lake, uh, just south of the fishing bridge. There, you can see the few tourists kind of walking around from from Lake Hotel and Lake Lodge. Brad, I know your book highlights these things, but aren't one of these pictures that also shows the first horse-drawn cart that also had the odometer. The odometer, yes, yeah. that's, and that's yeah. in, um, yeah. that's actually, you can see it, you can see it here. So these are the first wheels in Yellowstone. Yeah. And, you know, you can imagine um, dragging those. They drove, they, they wanted to measure their distance traveled, so it was, it was an odometer. Mm -hmm. and, and so, yeah, they, they drove that, they hauled that thing all over the place to, to measure how far they had, how far they had traveled. And I only know that because of him. You know, and, and, and you know, that's the thing I would say that aside from he being an award-winning photographer that we all know his beautiful regular photography, having the privilege of getting into this project a little bit with him, um, it's such a scholarly study that Brad has done. I mean, he researched and traveled to the archives and found all those original photos. And I had worked in Yeltsin for 12 years. I learned so much just going through all of his prep. So not only is a photographer, but he's a great researcher, historian, and author. So. You know, get that book out, boy. Yeah, I'm working on it. <laughs> <laughs> the cool thing about this one is, uh, you, this is uh, if you if you look real close, this is the uh, the frame of the Anna, the boat that's around the corner, and there's the, uh, the flies that they had. They were they they actually took it and they cached it somewhere for they were going to use it the following season. And uh, and then I think you can see the odometer. Yeah, here's the odometer card in there too. When is your book coming out? How uh, can I get it? Hopefully, uh, end of the year, early next year. And where will it be available? University Press of Colorado is publishing it, and they have uh, partnerships with, um, like, the Yellowstone Association uh, that runs all the bookstores. So um, it should be in all the bookstores um, here and here, maybe even here at the museum. Um, so. The original black and whites yeah. are glass plates, right? Are there inner yep. negatives for these? Or I'm sorry? So, uh, are you talking about like the modern day ones, or the modern day ones? These are not. So these fun. are yeah. So basically, at the National Archives, uh, any anything that you see with uh, like this ragged border here, right. um, those are those are all from the National Archives, and they scanned them in such a way they did like. Uh -huh kind of three different scans, and they scan them for the highlights and the midtones and the shadows. And so it's like, um, I mean, they were really hot shot about it, you know, and then they, you know, they put it all together, and so then you get the entire tonal spectrum, you know, so you can get detail. The negatives are actually really, really high quality, um, high quality negatives. They just have like a huge tonal range to them, probably more so than, you know, like modern, 
modern film did. So, and then several of the other ones, uh, you know, that don't have the border. Jackson donated a four-volume set of pictures, uh, of prints to Yellowstone in, in like the 1920s or 1930s. So did he print them or someone else? Or? He, it, it was either him or one of his assistants that printed them. And so he donated a four-volume set from the 1871 survey to Yellowstone. Um, and so that's where I, I, uh, I actually copied the copies of those. And, and one other thing that I know I found interesting that these folks probably will too is that some of your photos, uh, the ones that you bring out in the book um, with William Henry Jackson, you see Thomas Moran. He's using Thomas Moran yeah. in the shot. So yeah. you're, you know, you're seeing the Jackson that's one, that's photos. That's one thing I forgot to mention. It's, a, it's in all the descriptions, but in a lot of those early photos, Moran left the expedition when they went to the Geyser Basin. A group went back. Apparently there was a, an Indian attack of some sort and a military escort basically ditched them. Uh, you know, like, so yeah, they had a military escort uh, with um, of about 30 soldiers, and they had a, there was an Indian attack uh, back up in Montana, and they recalled the military escort, and so the survey was just kind of <laughs> winging it on, <laughs> on their own. And so, and, and they talk about they uh, when they were at this camp um, in the middle of the night, a dog came in came into camp. And they had no idea where this dog came from, and they could only assume that it was uh, they only assume that it was with Indian scouts, and so they kind of freaked out. And, like everyone got up and got their guns ready and everything like that, and nothing happened. Could you talk about Jackson a little bit? Did, did he photograph, for example, the Civil War, and what happened to him after this? So he he stayed with the survey. He was with the survey for eight years. Um, if if anyone else needs to take off, he won't hurt my feelings. Um, he started with the survey in 1871, or excuse me, in 1870, and he was with the survey until, I believe his last year with the survey was 1878 when they returned to Yellowstone for the last time. And then after that, he went, um, he went on and uh, founded, I think it was called the Detroit Photographic Company. He founded a photographic studio in Denver and worked there for a while, and then I believe he worked in Detroit for a while. He was hired to do a... Um, he was hired to do a, a photograph of the World's Fair, and then he embarked on like a worldwide tour, and he photographed all around the world in the uh, early 1900s. And then he got away from he got away from photographing, and got into painting. And there's one of his paintings uh, in here. It's actually a painting of the photographing in high places, which I think is kind of cool too. And he, I think the, the there's a there's a picture of him. He died in. I want to say 1940, at 99. Wow. Mm -hmm. And there's a picture, he visited Yellowstone just a couple of years before he died, and if, if I remember right, there's a picture of him in Yellowstone holding a 35 millimeter camera. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. So. <clears throat> well, one of the things about Jackson is I'm pretty sure that he walked across the entire continent as a bullwhacker. Yeah, he, he went from, uh, he went from, uh, not walked, but uh, from, um, Nebraska. He went to Nebraska and got on, got on the. This was before the Hayden surveys. He got on the, um, he got on the railroad and I believe got off in Lincoln, and then he got on a, a cattle drive. They moved a whole bunch of cattle from uh, Nebraska to Utah, and when he got to Utah, that's when he kind of started getting back into photography, and uh, the bull whacking was just kind of. You know how he paid his way out west. Um, his first his first engagement fell apart. Um, uh, apparently, he was engaged to this woman, and uh, and uh, this was way back. This is this is out east, and he was engaged to this woman, and they had um, they had a falling out, and the very next day he got on a train and <laughs> left um, and came west, and so. Um, <laughs> so he started photographing along the railroads, uh, like in 1869, 1868, I believe, 1869. He, was, he did a lot of photographing along because there was a, a lot of construction along the railroads, and so he was photographing the construction. And uh, uh, Hayden came across his work, um, uh, just came into his studio and saw his work on the construction of the rail on the railroad, and offered him a job. The first year, and it was basically unpaid. 
And so um, he worked for the Hayden Survey for the first year and didn't get paid for it, except I think he got some expenses and got maybe a travel site then and, and whatnot. But then uh, uh, Hayden was so impressed with his work that he hired him on. He put it, actually put it in his budget. And it was very important for Hayden to have a photographer on his survey. He saw, you know, he was one of the first um, uh, explorers to really grasp the importance of, of photography because there were two larger ex expeditions into Yellowstone before Hayden's, but neither one of them had a photographer. Both of them were coming out of Yellowstone saying this, all this crazy stuff, you know, uh, that, that uh, all the mountain men were saying, and everybody was telling on your nuts. Um, and so Hayden didn't want to make that mistake. And, uh, and uh, so that's one of the reasons he brought in, uh, brought in another photographer. There, was, there were a couple other photographers in Yellowstone in 1871. One of them was with, there was a military division that, that, uh, that yeah, there was a military division that um, kind of worked in tandem with Hayden's group. And they had a photographer with them. He took a couple hundred photographs, I believe, but they were based out of Chicago. And they went back to Chicago, and a week later, the Chicago fire happened. And it burned all of them, burned like all those negatives. And that is actually one of the things, one of the reasons Jackson's sort of celebrated as this first Yellowstone photographer is like only by kind of dumb luck. He happened to have all of these first photographs of Yellowstone. So. I have a couple of questions. Oh, let's, that, that's a good place to stop. Yeah, that's a good, yeah. Um, Grace yeah. is going to say one more thing and then. Yeah, so I'd like to thank you all for coming. Um, if you mentioned this program in the cafe, you receive 20% off. And we also want to thank all of our sponsors for these different exhibits, especially um, the Jackson Hole News and Guide and Perrion uh, Management. And um, we would love you to hang out. Um, be sure to see the other exhibit, Grand Teton National Park and Art. Um, and thank you. And thank you for having us.